Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you'd like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about autism stories. There's nothing I love more than a good story. And if that story is written by someone that's autistic, which includes autistic characters, then that person really has my attention. That's why I'm thrilled to talk with Isabel Azevedo about her film, Purple Heather, as well as how solitude is helpful in her life. And as well, we'll get into what stories she would like to tell in the future. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Isabel, it's always wonderful to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining me today on Autism Stories. Thank you for inviting me. Always good to talk to you too, especially because your questions, I already said that, your questions are the best. <laughs> you know what? I have a comment about that. I was watching, I don't know if you know the show called The Hot Ones. No. Tell me um, about this show. show. <laughs> it's a show, it's actually a YouTube show that became a show on Hulu. And the reason why I mentioned this is because this guy, he asks really good questions and the, the celebrities that go to be interviewed by him and they are doing the interview while they are eating hot wings and the spicy or hotness of the wing goes up in scale. I mean, it's really fun. It's really like, it's really fun. And the reason why I mentioned that it's because everybody compliments him about how he comes up with the questions like how did you find out about this like where did you find this information <laughs> so I was watching this week and I was like oh my god I need to mention that <laughs> it reminded me of you because you have such great like questions it's it's ridiculous like you should definitely like check it out just to see what I'm saying <laughs> I will I will uh put on Hulu to check out an episode and I'll definitely let you know what I think yes <laughs> You know, whenever someone's on Autism Stories, the first question I always ask them is, where does your story in the autistic community begin? Wow, okay, so I'm kind of a newbie, I would say, although I've seen people who are newbiers, <laughs> but I found out kind of that I was probably autistic like in October 2020, and I put it aside until like January when my health insurance switched <laughs> to a new one. And then I would say that that's actually when it started because I think in December, December 2020 to January 2021, that's when I actually started like looking more into it, you know, like am I autistic, am I not autistic? And I think that's when it started, but it really like, it really became a thing, I believe, when I came out let's say in April this year, because I, I got my, I knew I was autistic by February 2021, but I only got my official diagnosis in August, which even without the diagnosis, like we knew it doesn't matter much, but I only came out like in April this year. So I guess that's when I actually really started my story in the autistic community because that's when I started like actually saying, hey, I'm autistic, hey, I want to advocate for this, yeah. Now I wanted to talk to you today because you recently wrote, directed, acted, and did all the cinematography for the wonderful film Purple Heather, so you did, you did so much. When I hear someone doing all those things, I get a I get a bit overwhelmed. How did you manage from an executive functioning perspective to take on all these important roles for your film? It wasn't really like a film that was, oh my God, it's amazing. The cinematography is amazing and everything like that. <laughs> but I think I, I learned to do things with lists all the time since I was a teenager because I do struggle with executive dysfunction a lot. And I also struggle, I don't struggle to get organized, I struggle to get started. And I had a deadline that helped me a lot. I decided on 
a Friday morning that I was going to apply for these. And I have never done a fictional anything before. That was my first. So Friday morning, I saw this, oh my God, film festival. Film festival for smartphone made films, short films. And I said like, you know what? I need a little bit of like chaos in my life. <laughs> so I had 17 days or 18 days to do the whole thing. And I think that helps me. So having that deadline, getting close to it, helps me get organized and get going. But also I made lists for everything. So once I wrote the script, which I did that weekend, I started making like shot lists. What are the props that I'm going to need? You know, like, oh, she wears purple glasses. So I need to get purple glasses. So let's go to Amazon. Let's shop some stuff. And let's make like a schedule because most of the film I filmed myself with a tripod, but I needed my husband to film some shots and he is very busy. So I also needed to sketch with him. Like, when can you do this? When can you do that? And like, how can we make it in a way that is like quick? Because it can easily go, one scene can easily go for one hour. Like, believe it or not, you can easily spend one hour, two hours in one scene trying to get it right. And I was like, I don't want to do that. But I also like, it was a really good experience. That's what I'm going to tell you. Like, it was interesting because I proved myself that I can do this, especially with, you know, the executive dysfunctioning that I do struggle a lot with. Now, I read that you made uh, Purple Heather, your short film, based on your own experience and what you thought it would be like if you knew you were autistic in high school. So the film starts with the main character, Heather, talking about how solitude is uh, her everything. Thinking about yourself, how do you think solitude uh, helps you in, in your everyday life? I like to be around people because I like to observe people and to have like deep conversations, I realized. But when COVID came, I started, we all had to go into the solitude mode. <laughs> And I started liking it a lot. And I started seeing that it helps me in a way that when I'm with myself, I can think about things, I can have ideas, I can organize thoughts in my head that I wouldn't be able to do if I was, you know, like constantly with other people. I think that's how solitude helps me mostly. It's just... I need that time to kind of, how can I say, recharge. I thought I was more of a people person, and then I realized that not really. I'm more like, I like to be by myself, mostly. I don't know if I answered your question. Did I answer your question? You did. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> So one meaningful uh, scene to me in the film is when Heather's friend calls her kind of all of a sudden to ask her to hang out. And it seems that, at least to me, Heather wasn't expecting this communication. And she immediately says yes, even though there was a sense that she definitely did not want to hang out with her friend. <laughs> so I, I know for me, I do much better when I plan for communication. So what's the difference for you when you plan for communication versus when it, versus when it happens spontaneously for you? This is such a great question because I didn't realize that I put that there until you pointed it out. I did not realize... I actually replicated something that I've done in my life, but I do, I think I do what a lot of autistic folks do, which is like, we rehearse social interactions a lot. And even to go to a UPS store, <laughs> I rehearse the social interaction to go to a UPS store. The difference to me is like, at some interactions, I think it's, it's impossible to really rehearse and to really know what's going to happen. And some, like, I enjoy the spontaneity of it. But a lot of it, I often, I'm very impulsive. Let's just put it out there. I'm very impulsive. So this is one example of impulsivity or trying to get out of a conversation or something. Like, just saying what the person wants to hear. And if I, let's say in this example, if I knew she was going to call me, 
to ask me about this? I think I would still say yes because I'm still learning today how to say no to people without feeling like I'm hurting their feelings. But it would it would help. It helps more when I know what's going to happen, what is going to be asked, what's going to be the theme or whatever, you know. Like, I think it makes me feel better. Most of the situations, not all of them, but most of the situations, it makes me feel better when I kind of know where the things are going than when I don't. There are situations where it's fine, it's better, but most of them know because I'm afraid of what I might say because of my impulsivity. And that can go either by saying yes to something that I didn't want to, but that can also go to something that I say that hurt someone's feelings that I didn't mean to, but it just came out because filter, where is it? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Doesn't make sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, you know, I just happened to have one of these uh, situations this morning, and I've gotten better over the years. But I think for me, in those situations, like when I say the opposite of the truth, let's let's say it that way. I don't think I don't think I was lying. I think the opposite of the truth. Just I wasn't expecting it, and. I was concerned about the judgment of this person, <laughs> and now I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm thinking, I wish I had said something differently in that moment, but, you know, like, yeah. I, there's, a, there's a sense of panic, maybe? Yes. I did that last two weeks ago in class, by the way. Like, I ended up doing something that I did not rehearse because I was ready to say whatever I wanted to say, but I didn't expect the situation to happen the way that it happened. I expect the situation to happen when I invited the group to talk to the whole group because it was a group of seven that we were working with. We are no longer working with a group of seven. Thank goodness we broke up. But I ended up saying to one person in the middle of like an outside exercise of like shooting stuff, you know, and it became a whole thing that the professor the following week caught attention. Like, do not do this in the middle of the class. And it wasn't even me because I just told the person, like, yeah, I can't talk to you about the next project because I'm not going to. We are not going to be together anymore. It just came out. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, shoot. And then it became a whole thing because she got so desperate because she didn't want to stay with the other the other people. She... She ended up, like, going, everybody, like, asking who could she, like, join the group. And the professor was in the middle of a lesson. It's just that it was outdoors. And I felt like it was my fault. And then I realized, well, I do have responsibility here, but it's not my fault because she was the one who went, like, making the chaos between the other four that remained, you know, like, and everybody. But I did not handle that well, in my opinion. And it was because... I kind of did that. I panicked. I really panicked, especially because she begged me to stay in our group. And I'm like, no. And I'm like, no. No, 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 no. Um, no, we are not doing this. We are not doing this. I seriously panicked. Oh, my God. Yes. Now I'm like remembering. Oh, my God. I seriously panicked there. You have no idea. I mean, I think you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I do. So one of the interesting things about Purple Heather is the way that it was shot, at least to me. Um, I don't know, maybe this is becoming more common than I realized. But it was shot exclusively with an iPhone and an iPad Pro. What was that process, and would you recommend the shooting a film like this to others? You know, I have a camera, but I chose to because I wanted to send this to this specific film festival that is, you know, it was smartphone kind of like had to so that was a choice that I made but I would say if you do not have a camera you have an idea and you want to make some kind of like a film I would say do it like use your phone like a lot of people are using phones today especially Apple they are very often pointing like getting people to actually shoot on their phones to make it as advertising. I remember that I think Lady Gaga, maybe she shot, I never saw the music video, but I remember she shot a, maybe two years ago, three years ago, 
there was one music video from her album that came out that was shot completely shot on iPhone. Like they put iPhones in cars, like attached to cars to film and everything. And now I know that the iPhone has a cinematic mode. I my iPhone doesn't have it, but I know that the 13 and the 14 they have the cinematic bro, cinematic mode. Is it equal to the camera? Never, because it's AI. I don't know AI technology, whatever. With the camera, you do that. You know how you make the blurry behind the person. Mm-hmm. So the out of focus, in focus thing, they have that, but you put that automatically. You don't make it happen, and it's never going to be the same as the camera. But it's still, I would still, I would stop with my nerding about like film and shooting and all, all that. Like I definitely recommend shooting with whatever you have if you have an idea and you want to make some content and you want to start. Like definitely. For me, I didn't love it much because of the, it was kind of limiting, but it still came out, like, I'm very proud of what I made. I don't love the cinematography, but I'm very proud of what I made, and I would say do it with whatever you have in your hands if you have an idea. Now, apparently you aren't the only talented person in your family because the music for the film was from uh, your husband, Ben. And I really thought the music worked perfectly for for the film. I think music can be a really, you know, underrated element of a film. So how did you and Ben go about deciding on the music for Purple Heather? Because if me and my spouse work together on a project like this, I don't know how it would have turned out. (laughs) Yeah, well, we do have some heat heads sometimes with some things. But with this one, so we have a piano at home. It's not like a fancy piano. It's a basic piano, you know, that you can actually record from because I like playing. I'm not playing much, but I like playing. I don't really know much, but I know enough to do things here and there. But he knows. He knows much more. He actually went to school for music as a minor. So I was hearing him, like, playing this song, you know, like, I don't know the name of the poser, but I was hearing him playing this song, and I was like, this song would be perfect with Purple Heather. And he was like, oh, and I was like, can you make a variation of it? Like, can you make your own thing, but, like, on the, like, on this style? And he said that he would try, and he came out with two songs. So it's just two songs that we use. That's all. And he made that, but... Yeah, it was a collaboration in the sense of, like, I just said, I like this vibe here of this song that's, you know, known. Can you make a variation of that? And he did, like, two. And I was like, yes, this, I mean, I told him, like, this works perfectly. When I know, I know. Like, when I hear a song, that's the thing. When I hear a song, I know. I'm like, I know what I'm going to do with this. And I do it. It's a very, like, weird relationship of my ears in my mind. So, yeah, that's how it went down. We didn't really fight about that part. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you hope people uh, take away from watching your film, Purple Heather? I'm hoping that girls and women, when they watch it, they might, like, if they think there's, like, something, like, odd with them, because that's how I felt, at least, I hope that they investigate, and that's what I've been saying since I I found out I'm ADHD and autistic, is that I really hope that people will investigate instead of accepting that they have depression and anxiety when it's a little bit more than that, you know? Like, it's something that you're not being accepted, you're not not being yourself, and all these things, um, and... I hope they see this and they think like, what if I am autistic or what, what if my daughter is autistic, you know? And I'm hoping for other people that are actually not on the spectrum at all, that they look at it and see like, oh my God, so can I like, can I be making this person uncomfortable because I'm trying to make her stop moving her legs? Because that has happened to me my whole life. (laughs) People trying to, like, literally holding down my legs to make me stop, like, moving it. You know, am I forcing her to make eye contact? Like, this is the kind of things that 
I would really like people to maybe catch from it. I really hope, I don't know if it was like, if it's enough on the screen that people can get that, but that's what I was hoping, like going for. You know, there's been a push in recent years, certainly to have autistic people playing autistic, you know, characters in uh, TV, film. But I'm wondering about autistic writers, whether writing, exclusively writing the part or at least being in the room and having an important input. How important do you think that is in this process as we evolve to have better representation of autistic characters in media? I think for any type of representation, I believe that, you know, if I'm white, I shouldn't be writing necessarily about the experience of a black person because I'm not, I'm, I didn't go through their experience. The same way, I think, if you are writing about the experience of being autistic, you should have, at least you should have somebody with you writing, co-writing with you. It's not that, you know, like the writer can get that experience that I'm passing to that person and like making it, make it into a script, make it into a book, but they shouldn't just decide to sit down and write that experience without having either a co-writer with them or at least two, three autistic people as a consultant with them. Like, and I believe this is for any kind of minority because you can imagine what the experience of, of someone is, but you won't know based on what you read that mostly written by, you know, I mean, if I were going to go by the books, I would not know that I was autistic. And they keep bringing characters that are genius and, like, have this photographic memory. And, like, I'm like, oh, my God, why don't I have that? <laughs> um, you know, it's not, it's not accurate. Yes, this happens, but it's not always like this. It's such a big spectrum. Like, can you, can you try to make stories that, like, bring different perspectives and different traits, you know, and, and show different experiences, including that, you know, we can do things like without our parents, without like, we need to like really go after making television, these people, studios, whatever, like bring those who can actually tell you what the experience is and more than one as I've seen, like, the autistic community saying, like, nothing about us without us and more than one, right? Because my experience is not yours. There is that too. It's really important in my opinion. Sorry I went on for so long with this question, <laughs> but it's really important in my opinion to, to have writers that can actually, like, that actually have it. Because after all, that's what we are. When we write, we all write about something that has happened to us or the, the way that we see things. Wish that more people would, would hire us. Like, I'm here and I'm available. And how can people uh, watch your film, Purple Heather? It's actually on YouTube, on my channel I made recently, which is called Cloudful TV. And it's also on cloudful.tv on the website is just that cloudful.tv. There is a there is a page there that you can also watch it. And there's also like I'm going to post more things about the film, like a director, since I'm like I can call myself a director. <laughs> um I'm going to do like a commentary too. I'm I'm meaning to do that and I'm going to. And we'll share that in the uh, podcast description for the for this episode. So I know a goal of yours is to tell stories from the neurodivergent and disabled communities. So I'm wondering, what are some stories you'd like to tell in the future from these communities? Wow. Um, well, I really like to talk about, like, really, like, the life experience and lessons that can either be the lessons that the person herself learned or lessons that we can teach to other people. Like, I'm really into things that can teach lessons. Both, like, 
making and watching. So I would really like to, I believe, tell more stories about women growing up not knowing that they were autistic, like finding out later in life, either in their 20s, 30s, 40s. I mean, I heard of one person who found out she was in her 60s. I was like, wow. And exploring both sides of it, not only the good part, but not also only the bad part. I like to to see both parts, both sides of the coin. I don't have a specific stories, like very specific, but that's that's basically what I would like to show, like what are the challenges, but also what are like, if there is a good part, what is it? Like both. Well, Isabel, as always, I appreciate the conversation and your time and for your TV uh, recommendation today. So thanks so much. <laughs> yes, thank you for inviting me to participate for like advertising my film too. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks so much to Isabel for the conversation. To watch Isabel's film, Purple Heather, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. This is the part of the episode now where I'm going to tell you a little bit about Autism Personal Coach. So did you know that Autism Personal Coach, uh, we provide extraordinary support to live self-sufficient and purpose-driven lives through our customized coaching? If this is something that you may be interested in learning more about, please visit AutismPersonalCoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.